Several times in the preceding videos I've mentioned this phenomena of pull zero cancellation and we kind of put that issue aside while we were doing the previous developments but I wanted to go ahead and talk about pull zero cancellation and do a little example just so you could see something concrete about what pull cancellation is and how it might occur sometimes. So pull zero cancellation and we're going to look at this basically by way of an example. So we're going to work with the discrete time signal x of k and x of k is equal to alpha to the k times the quantity u of k minus u of k minus n. So this is our unit step function. This one right here turns on at time zero. This one here turns, turns on at times k equal capital N. So by subtracting these two pieces, we end up basically with a finite width pulse function that is on at time zero. And then at time capital N, it actually goes to zero at that time. So this signal is actually a finite duration signal, and we've studied finite duration signals, and we know that when taking their z-transform, their region of convergence is actually the entire z-plane. The only points that we have to watch out for are possibly z equals zero or z equals plus or minus infinity. So we know that this signal here should have a region of convergence that's everywhere except for possibly a point or two. So let's go ahead and take the z-transform of this signal. So I'm going to go ahead and break this up into the two pieces just by distributing my multiplication. So x of k is alpha to the k u of k minus alpha to the k u of k minus n. And I can rearrange this just a little bit. The first term I'll just leave alone. But when I see this piece right here, I see k on the alpha, but I see k minus n inside the unit step. It sure would be nice if both of those were k minus n because then I could use my time shift theorem. Well, I can get this to turn into alpha to the k minus n if I just multiply by alpha to the n and then change it to alpha to the k minus n. If you add both these exponents, you're back exactly where you started. So I haven't changed anything right here. That quantity, that product, is still alpha to the k, but now it's written in a way that will let me use the time shift theorem here in just a minute because alpha to the capital N is just a number. It's just a scalar there. So now I have u of k minus n. So let's go ahead and take the z transform of this quantity right here. We know now that x of z is equal to z over z minus a. It's just a table lookup for this first component, taking the z transform of that. And then this next part, this is just a constant, so I'll factor that out. And then I'll go ahead and use the time shift theorem on this piece. The time shift theorem says start off with your normal x of z. So if there was no time shift here, I would just have alpha to the k u of k which we know has a z transform z over z minus alpha. So I write down z over z minus alpha, but now I need to apply the time shift theorem. I need to multiply by z to the minus n. So that term, z to the minus n, is basically due to the time shift theorem of the z transform. I can actually rewrite this a little bit if I want to divide top and bottom by z. Another equivalent way of writing this difference is in this form right here. So another way you might write this down, different books use kind of different conventions for how they like to have either positive z's or z's raised to negative powers. If I look at this on a term-by-term -term basis, this term right here, I can factor into alpha times z inverse to the n, right? That's just factoring and raising both those quantities to the capital N, and the denominator stays the same. So just a minor rearrangement. If I look at this first term, this term all by itself actually has a pole when z equals alpha, right? When z equals alpha, then z inverse is 1 over alpha, and I'd end up with alpha times 1 over alpha is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So this individual term has a pole at z equals alpha. Same thing for this second term. I can analyze it just all by itself. We see that it has a pole at z equals alpha as well due to that part. But it also has an nth order 0 at z equals infinity. When z is infinity, z inverse is 1 over z, 1 over infinity is 0, so the numerator is 0 whenever z equals infinity. Since the numerator is raised to the power n, we call this an nth order 0 at infinity. So this term by itself has a pole at z equals alpha, this term by itself has a pole at z equals alpha, and this term by itself also has a nth order 0 at z equals infinity. So it sounds like we have some poles and zeros in this, even though we know when we're all done, we have to be back to a finite length signal that doesn't have any poles except for possibly one spot. So if we do a combination here and get a common denominator, 
they already both have a common denominator, so I can just multiply one times this and then subtract off of that, and I end up with this numerator right here. And look what I end up with. This still has a pole at z equals to alpha. So all I've done is algebraically combine these two terms into this piece right here. And by looking at it, like I said, we see that we still have a pole when z equals alpha, but I also have an nth order zero at z equals alpha. Things have changed a little bit. By combining these two terms, when z is equal to alpha, z inverse is 1 over z, which is 1 over alpha. 1 over alpha times alpha is 1. 1 raised to the power n is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So now I have a 0 here when z equals alpha. So I have a pole at z equals alpha, and I have n zeros at z equals alpha which means that this simplifies into just the quantity 1 minus quantity alpha z inverse to the n minus 1. The net result of this is one of these zeros cancels the only pole, and I'm left with a quantity that contains only zeros. So this phenomenon is what we call pole zero cancellation. In this case, I only had one pole. One of my zeros canceled one of the poles. There are no more poles left, and I'm left with only zeros. So that is what we mean by pole zero cancellation. In this case, I kind of started off with something we knew this had to happen because it has to turn into a finite duration signal, which has to have a region of convergence that's the entire plane, so we knew this thing had to happen. Sometimes when you're just working with signals and adding things together, though, you know each piece has a region of convergence that might exclude certain points, you know, inside of a circle or outside of a circle, but then once you combine them together, this pole zero cancellation occurs, and the region of convergence of the combined signal actually grows. Most of the time it gets smaller, it's the intersection of these regions, but every once in a while this happens and you end up with a region of convergence that then it's larger than what you started with. So just kind of keep an eye out for that, it's what we call pole zero cancellation, and uh, now you've seen a concrete example of that and you can be aware of when that may occur.